It would be an understatement to say that plastic is everywhere. Our water bottles, grocery bags, toothpaste tubes, and the packaging that covers nearly everything we buy. It also ends up in the ocean, foods, and our bodies in the form of microplastics. That's something local Dr. Philip Landrigan warns could be even worse for our health than we realize, writing in the New England Journal of Medicine that inaction is no longer an option. Landrigan is the director of the Program for Global Public Health and the Common Good at Boston College. He joins me now along with Kirsty Petchy, executive director of Just Zero. Thank you both so much for being here. So we've all seen the clips of the turtles with the plastic straws stuck in their noses and the beaches littered with plastic bottles. Um, I want to play this clip of six-year-old Bella explaining the issue in the 2019 Frontline PBS docu documentary, The Plastic Problem. Plastic gets into the ocean and then fishies eat it and then um, they get sick. So I felt that she kind of summed it up pretty well, but I imagine that you both have more to add. Kirsty, um, can you can you explain? I mean, it's not just in the fish in the water supply; it's in the air as well. How pervasive is this problem, and what are microplastics? So, unfortunately, because plastic is the petroleum industry's Plan B, and because plastic is very, very toxic, it takes chemicals to make plastic. Um, we have microplastics everywhere now. Clothes are now, our textiles are about 60%, two-thirds plastic. So micro, uh, microplastics, very small bits of plastic, which is how plastic breaks down, uh, are in the air from our dryers, in the water from our wash. Uh, and then our food is so pervasively uh, packaged in plastic that we're seeing bits of plastic in our drinks, in our food that are packaged in plastic. Because the way that plastic breaks down is that it breaks down into these tiny, tiny, minuscule little pieces, and those get everywhere into the fish, into everything else. Um, this 2016 World Economic Forum report showed that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans by weight than fish. And so we know it gets into the fish, and then we eat the fish. But what do we know generally about the effect on, on people who eat the fish? I don't know if you eat fish still. We, but... I, I love fish. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and microplastics in the ocean get into fish, and when we eat fish, those microplastics get into us, and, and they accumulate in our body. And, and, and they have been detected now in many tissues, in colon, in lung, in arteries, uh, in the placenta, in pregnant women. Wow. And so what do we know in terms of research, and that perhaps there just isn't enough research, about how that happens and what the actual health effects are on people? You said you eat fish. Yep. I mean, if it's already in the water supply, in the air... I guess you might as well enjoy fish, right? But and, what is the actual impact on, on us? Sure, and there's lots of health benefits to eating fish, and because I live in New England, I love New England fish. But, but the, um, the plastics in the fish are, are a hazard. And up until recently, people would say, well, the plastics are in there, and, and the microplastics get into our bodies, but there's no evidence of harm. Well, the paper that came out this week in the New England Journal of Medicine changes all that. Because this important paper, which was done by a team of scientists in Italy, examined the carotid arteries of patients with, uh, with heart disease. And they found that people who had microplastics in their carotid artery, in their neck, were 4.5 times more likely to have a heart attack, a stroke, or to die over the next three years. So that's the first paper that I know of, the first report, that microplastics in the human body actually cause disease and death. Wow. But that's the first report, and obviously there's more research coming, I would hope. I think there'll be a lot of research coming. I think it will come quickly. Um, I'm sure some people, for example, the plastics industry, will say one paper doesn't prove anything. Mm. I agree, it doesn't prove cause and effect, but it sends a strong signal, a signal that can't be ignored, and now more research is needed. Well, speaking of the plastics industry, and you talked about petroleum, um, I was wondering about how we got here. I think uh, generally, you know, our addiction to plastics kind of began after World War II. We had been told during wartime to scrimp and save and reuse everything. And then this manufacturing boom happened and continued. And we went to play a couple of clips of, of advertising then and yeah. more recently. 
The ingenious alchemy of coal and oil provides the material. Ingenious machinery presses and stamps and molds the material into a wide variety of products, articles for household use, as well as tools for industry. Today, there are materials that help lock out harmful contaminants and reduce spoilage, keeping us safe and the food we eat fresh. Plastics make it possible. So plastics make it possible. I mean, there's a strong lobbying effort here as well, Kirsty. Yeah, the, we didn't choose this, and that's a misnomer. We, the, this was foisted upon us. This is this is a choice that the petroleum industry has made to sell a product. If you can sell a single-use product, you can sell it over and over again, or a product in single-use packaging. So the the rise of plastic cups and our and our beverages sold in plastic bottles. And all the plastic packaging that we see, you can't buy food now without it being in plastic. That's not a choice. That's the, that's the, we're seeing the subsidies to the petrochemical industry and the petrochemical industry power at play there. So, um, the other thing to remember about this is while the, uh, while the plastic industry will say, well, this is one study and Dr. Landrigan is totally right about this. This is, this is the cusp of a whole wave of studies that we're going to see, in my opinion. While that's correct that this is just one study, we know already that plastic pollutes at every stage of its production, use, and disposal or recycling. In other words, fracking is very toxic. Uh, the chemical spills when, when uh, you know, like in East Palestine, when the train derailment happened, those chemicals are used to make plastic that 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 derailment uh, uh, can, the train contained. The manufacturing, the crackers. Uh, the use, there's not only just microplastics, the chemicals are leaching into the food and drink you eat too. So that's not just the bits of plastic, that's actually the chemicals from plastic too. And then finally, we have five incinerators in Massachusetts that burn about 450,000 tons of plastic each year. And that, the chemicals from that, uh, those incinerators and that burning are horrifically dangerous. So again, we knew plastic was bad already. This is just another nail in the coffin, quite literally. And you mentioned that plastic production is consistently, continues to be on the rise in your, in your editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's right. 99% of plastic comes from fossil carbon. It comes from gas. It comes from oil. It comes from coal. It's grown 200 times since the end of World War II. Its on production is on track to double by 2040. It's on track to triple by 2060. Uh, if that, if we can't bend that curve, the world will be awash in plastics. It already is, and it'll be, it will be inundated in plastics by 2060 unless, unless we can find a way to cap plastic production. And there are some international efforts towards that. You, you mentioned a, a UN treaty that got together in 2022, and they'll be meeting in April to kind of get together and kind of hammer out what they'll be doing. Can you talk a little bit about what their goal is and what kind of opposition they've faced? Sure. So I'm very optimistic about this. In, in 2022, the UN Environment Assembly, which is a, a gathering of uh, people from almost 200 countries, came together, passed a resolution that the world needed a plastic treaty. The goal of the treaty is to end plastic pollution. And the negotiators have bet three times so far they're scheduled to meet again at the end of April in, in Ottawa. And um, people like myself in the public health community are saying that the only rational way to control plastic pollution and control the diseases it causes is to put a global cap on plastic production similar to the cap on CO2 production that was agreed to under the Paris climate agreement. Now, of course, the petrochemical industry is pushing back. What they're saying is we need more recycling. Mm. Well, I love recycling, but plastic recycling is a scam. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to ask, it's a scam. Uh, abs well, yeah. <laughs> the plastic recycling is a scam. There's a lot there. Kirstie, uh, you had referenced in a Just Zero blog post this Guardian report from 2023 that found that, um, that this international team of scientists found that uh, microplastics released in the water uh, amounted to 13% of the plastic processed in this recycling plant in the UK. And that recycling facility could be releasing up to 75 billion particles in each cubic meter of wastewater. So recycling is also a massive contributor to the amount of microplastics in the system as well. I mean, that's obviously, you know, when people are looking for solutions, they immediately go towards recycling, right? But that may not be the best or most efficient path forward. 
That's correct. That's correct. That's part of the story we were told that we were sold. Um, plastic recycling is mechanical plastic recycling, you know, chopping it up and making it into a new product is releases a tremendous amount of microplastics as you just explained so well. Uh, not only that, but most plastic is not going to get recycled. Just because something can be recycled in a lab doesn't mean that it's going to be sorted, uh, driven, you know, driven somewhere and then have value. Um, most of these plastics are a mix of different plastics. There's a cap on your carton and the carton is lined with plastic. That's never going to get recycled. So it's very important to differentiate between something that's technically recyclable in a lab and, as you said, is very toxic to recycle versus uh, versus something that's just never going to get recycled. Uh, so, you know, those are there's a, there's layers there. What what solutions are being put forward that you see as as effective? Well, we, we know that certain plastics are so toxic and really can be replaced so easily that they should be out immediately. Polystyrene, styrene, it's, it's a, a resin number seven, uh, number six, excuse me. That's been banned in many uh, communities across Massachusetts and in, in states. So we need to pass a polystyrene ban across the board in Massachusetts. Um, we also know that we want our food and beverages to be packaged in reusable, refillable systems in glass. So one step to get to that would be a deposit return system, a bottle bill expansion in Massachusetts. That would mean that there'd be sorting of our beverage containers and eventually refill of our beverage containers in good, clean glass. That's the best way to have your beverage delivered to you by a corporation. Um, and then also, you know, bands are one idea. Systems for refill and reuse are another idea that work. They work really, both of those things work really, really well. But we also know that we have to be realistic about um, actually closing the loop. And when you're going to be recycling something that's endlessly recyclable, like glass or metal, that's fine. But just to acknowledge that plastic is not recyclable and to treat it as a toxic material that we should be phasing out as quickly as possible. So I wanted to really quickly, we don't have a ton of time, but I wanted to ask you both about some items that might be sinister and perhaps the, rate them on dangerousness in my single-use plastic bag, which is reusable. I've got a soda, um, some produce here. There's an apple and an orange, which I know can contain microplastics. Uh, beer. We talk about the beer fact that it's got microplastics, I guess, in the actual beer is what I read. Floss, toothpaste, want to make sure you can see these. Mm -hmm. uh, Welsh's snack pack and a lipstick that I used earlier. So first of all, anytime you can be using something that's reusable, truly reusable, not like that bag, but something that you can wash and use over and over again, that's always your best choice. And anything that doesn't have plastic in it. So in other words, even if it's possible that that fruit has microplastics in it, um, it's, if it's not wrapped in plastic, if you were able to purchase it without having to put it in a plastic bag or it didn't come in a plastic bag, you're still ahead of the game there, I would say. So much of this plastic is, is completely unnecessary. And it's a new creation, as, as Christy said, it's, it's been foisted upon us. When I was a kid, Coke came in glass bottles. And uh, as children, we used to scrounge those bottles. There was a nickel deposit. You'd bring them back to the store. It was great. This stuff is used once. It's, it's tossed away. And it just fills the landfills, creates microplastics, causes pollution, and creates profits for the fossil fuel industry. It's a, it's a right. manufactured addiction. That's right. And the other thing, too, is there's some sneaky plastic there that you should be aware of. So Coke is an acidic drink. It's probably leaching chemicals into uh, the drink. Also, the capping process, there's about an 80, 90 percent chance that there are microplastics from the capping process in that Coke. So in some ways, the Coke is the worst, I would say. And as the doctor just said, it could very easily be in a glass uh, bottle. So what, you know, uh, then remember that that beer is lined with plastic, that aluminum can. Yeah. So um, you've got plastic there, too, that could also leach into the beverage. Uh, which is why, to me, glass is king. Mm. The soap, Irish Spring, at least it's in a recyclable, it looks like a cardboard box. But I, you know, there's a lot of soap out there you can buy without a box, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and right now it's just the fancy soaps. You should be able to buy all your soap without a box. So 
that's where regulation and, um, you know, it's not just on the consumer. We shouldn't have to police ourselves so utterly that that we can't even, you know, purchase some soap. We should be able to go buy a beverage, buy some soap without having to worry about plastic packaging. Great. Well, Dr. Philip Landrigan and Kirsty Petchy, thank you both so much for being here.